Thank you guys. Thanks again for being here. Okay, I'm gonna dive in because um, we at Branches, we don't tend to be particularly bookish, and it's been a long time since we've been um, camped within a scripture passage or a book of the Bible for some time. You might remember that we'd done the essential passages of scripture for a while, jumped into James briefly, and then have been on kind of weekly detours in gypsy living at Branches for so long, wondering where are we going next? Well, we're diving into a series called the new way of seeing through Philippians. And we'll be here for about 10 weeks going through this book. So I want to just start with saying, entering into a passage that are letters from Paul, and these are prison letters. So these are letters that he wrote. There are four of the books that he wrote from prison. Paul was in prison a number of times. This is one of the times that he was in prison. He's writing to the church at Philippi. And so we have a lot of scripture to jump into because the only way to really read this letter is to read it in the context of what happened to Paul. And our purpose and our hope is not in a book study to say, be like Paul or find a way to uh, pull out life lessons. We aren't life hacking through scripture and giving an application of what it is that you need to do to make it so that your life is a little bit better or that you change your ways of living because of the what Paul has been through. We are worlds away from the context of 50, 52 AD uh, Roman prison. We are worlds away from a cultural context of being Romans in a Jewish land or Jews in a Roman or Greek land. We are worlds away from being a religion that is dominated by an occupied governing force. We are worlds and worlds away from a hospitality culture or a culture that is dealing with interpersonal relationships very differently than we do. So we need the Spirit to inform our hearts and our minds to kind of place us into this space in 50 or so years after the death of Jesus and find ourselves in the context of the book of Philippians and no better way to do that than through the book of Acts. So this week will be an introduction and I will tell you the story. We will together walk through the story of Paul on his missionary journeys, finding himself in Philippi, and then what happened when he gets there. And ultimately, this is a letter that he's writing after he's gone to Philippi. He's left and gone to Rome and he's been imprisoned again. Yet again, Paul finds himself in jail and he's writing to his friends a church, like Andy and Jess coming from a far space saying, these people whom I love that are family, I need to write a letter. But if you had no idea what happened in Maui or what Branches was doing to support them, if you had no context for what was going on there and you just read their mail or you just read the letter that they wrote to us, it would be impossible to get a sense of the heart that Andy just put on display. Right? That doesn't come across in text until you know the context. And I think Andy had a little bit of Paul's heart. As you read through Philippians, you'll see this outpouring of affection and joy and tears and sentiment and love, the overwhelming love that gets poured out to his friends at Philippi through this letter. So I'll start with saying I've never been to prison um, yet. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I have not yet been to prison. I guess that doesn't go without saying. Um, I have yet to been to prison. I've been to jail not as many times as David. I've served with many of you at the OC Juvenile Hall for the Christmas pageant. I have been to jail with David. Um, David's been to jail many times. Some of us in this room have been uh, arrested and been put in jail, been put in prison. There is a sense, I know, I'm not going to make you raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand if you've been in prison. There are for sure people that have been to prison in this, in this room. You will have an insight into these letters and what it's like to be in prison. I, I don't really know what it's like. I don't know what Paul's going through. I certainly have never been imprisoned illegally. I've never been beaten when being put in prison and have certainly never been put in prison in chains. And in Roman times, when you're put in prison, they don't provide three square and a healthy, safe living environment. If you're to eat anything, then your friends and family have to provide everything for you. They're not going to bring you food. Prison guards are not going to take care of you. You're totally dependent upon friends and community and family. So the context of prison letters from Paul is important. And the context of this letter is spelled out in Acts. Before I jump into the passage, 
give you a couple of things about the who, what, where, when. So in Philippians, this is A.D. 61 or 62, as this is written, Paul gets a gift from a friend who traveled real far to get into prison to provide for them because, again, the prison's not giving them anything. And this friend almost died on the journey. Paul writes and talks about the sickness came over them. He almost didn't make it, miraculously did. And he's responding to the gift, much like Maui, right? Much like branches stepping forward and saying, we're going to give everything that we get for these next couple of months to Maui to, to support these people. And now he's responding with love. Oh, my gosh, this gift. He writes a letter to his friend. That's the first context. Writing a letter to his friends in Philippi because they just showered him with essentials that he needed. Otherwise, he wouldn't make it. Philippi is a place in Macedonia, and it was called just Italicum. It's miniature Rome. It was a city that was created for the purpose of having transplant soldiers outside of Italy and Greece, way over here if you're looking at a map, and then Macedonia. Nowhere near it is a little place that they wanted to have another hub for Rome, and they called it just Italicum because they were basically saying, this is as if you are in Rome. When you're born here, you get Roman rights and citizenships. You don't pay property taxes and other Roman taxes. If you're a citizen of Rome and or Philippi, you are benefited with a lot, a lot of things that a non-Roman citizen would get. It also meant that anything that went in Italy and in Rome is how it goes here in Philippi. It was founded mostly with soldier transplants, so there were really no Jewish folks there, certainly not enough Jewish men. We know this because Jewish law required there to be at least 10 Jewish men to have a synagogue and to meet and pray and be present. It's assumed that because when Paul first arrived there, he's looking around and there are no synagogues, the first place he goes on Sabbath is down to a river where he meets women. We'll get into that in Acts. But he doesn't go into the synagogues, which is the custom. Paul's custom is to go someplace and find the church. And for him, that was synagogue. Because this is a very Roman place and very Greek place, there are no synagogues and virtually no Jewish folk and certainly not enough or at least not even 10 Jewish men. So let's dive into Acts. I want to start with Acts 15. I'm going to burn through a lot of scripture because we're going to get the story. I can't tell it better than Luke. So Luke tells the story of Paul's journey through Rome and through his travels. And he's gone to a first journey to Cyprus. And he brought a buddy, Barnabas. He and Paul went out and had his first journey with Barnabas. And they also brought his cousin, Barnabas' cousin, John Mark. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that Mark was with Barnabas as his cousin and with Paul. But Mark bailed on him. You don't hear that a lot talked about, but, but he, he actually uses the term deserted him. So what does Luke say about this? Sometime later, Paul and Barnabas... After that first journey, they're meeting together. They're guys getting together saying, what do we do next? He says, let's go back and visit believers in all the towns where we preached in the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he deserted them. I think, I think Paul maybe didn't even like him. He's like, this guy bailed on us. He deserted us. I don't want Mark with me next time, Barnabas. Okay. So he deserted us in Pamphylia and had not continued with them on the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. I would imagine the argument ensued. I'm not bringing Mark, and I'm taking my ball and going home. Paul leaves. So Barnabas says, all right, I'll take Mark. He's my cousin, so I kind of have to. Barnabas takes Mark, and they sail for Cyprus, which is where they first went. It was an initial journey. They came back, and they just said, let's just go back to the church that we planted there. But Paul chooses Silas, another friend, and they left. And the hope was for Paul that he was going the opposite direction towards Asia. He wanted to spread the gospel into a very new territory. But before he did that, he needed help. So he's recruiting his friend, Timothy. Now, Timothy joins Paul and Silas. And if we look at Acts 15, 41, you can see, as Luke records here, he went through Syria and Sil. Celsia, strengthening the churches. Paul came to Derby and then Lystra, where, he, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. That's a fascinating little tidbit of info. Hold on to that, right? Paul's mom was Jewish. Paul's dad was Greek. I'm sorry, Timothy. Thank you. The believers at 
at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, of Timothy, and Paul wanted to take him on the journey. He's all right, this guy might be a good member of the team. Seems like people like him. He circumcised him. Interesting. Paul did. Because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was Greek. They traveled from town to town. They delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. It says, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered a letter, the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew in numbers. So what happened was one of the things that early starting to happen in the early church was this trend that they said, in order to be a Christian, you must be Jewish first. Jewish, then Christian was the model. Be circumcised, then be baptized. And this was a big enough rift that they had to get all of the muckety mucks together to say, let's have the apostles and let's have the, uh, the teachers that are around and the elders and gather in Jerusalem. So we're going to do this at home turf. Bring everybody to Jerusalem. Let's talk about this and make a decision on, do you need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian? And they landed and wrote it down in a letter. No, you don't need to be circumcised in order to be a Christian. Now they want to have this journey that Paul and Silas and Timothy are going to take to say, people should really know about this. This is kind of a big deal. There is no way to spread this other than by foot and by letter to go and physically read this in the synagogues. You've got to go in the church and say, hey, everybody, good news. I mean, if ever there was a gospel of good news, the good news gospel was like, I bring good news. You do not have to be circumcised. And what they did to prepare for this journey is circumcise Timothy. Oh, taking it for the team. Why? Why did Timothy get circumcised? Because in order to even enter into synagogue, they knew, as it says there, Timothy's dad's Greek. He's not Jewish. And everybody knew it. So in order for Timothy to enter into synagogue to proclaim the good news, that you don't have to be circumcised, he was circumcised. Whoa. I mean, taking it for the team. So the hope was, let's go to these synagogues. We'll enter out, go to the different various churches and or places where it's more formally a, a synagogue established, and we'll give them the good news. It is good news. Slight detour. In my day job, I meet with lots of people that fairly quickly get into some very kind of intimate discussions. One of the times, I was meeting with a guy named Carl. I'd never met him before. We don't often talk about circumcision in our daily lives. This wasn't like, um, we don't really talk about our branches ever either. I mean, this isn't part of our normal discourse. But I'm sitting down with Carl. We're maybe just to tell me about your family life. Married, have a couple of kids, all of that stuff. Tell me about you, Carl. He stops me as I'm asking him, tell me about your life, Carl. And he leans over the table and he says, Ryan, are you circumcised? sat back in my chair. I said, Carl, I think that's more of a second meeting kind of a question, don't you? <laughs> Carl had written his thesis on the attempt to change in the medical community the degree by which it's prevalent to circumcise folks in modern day, and he wanted to get into it. And I wasn't as familiar with the gospel of Timothy <laughs> at the time, and I could just have said, hey, well, they all agreed on this in AD like 50 in Jerusalem, so I'm with you. Um, but I moved on from that fairly quickly. I didn't tell Paul whether I was or wasn't. I'm not going to tell you either, because that's a, that's a second meeting kind of question. So they want to they wanna go out into Asia and into the synagogues and give this message. And this is where it gets interesting. Acts 16, 6 through 10. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. We don't know what that means. Now, most likely we tend to kind of, because Acts does have a lot of otherworldly things happening, it's easy to kind of forget the earthiness of what's happening, like a dispute or an argument with Paul and Silas and Barnabas, or the very kind of relationally 
earthiness of the real things that were happening. We could, le- we could read into this that the spirit preventing them could have been a bridge washed out or ran out of money or the way they saw their lives being imbued with, we do that which the Lord permits us to do. And if I can't go because I'm out of money or the bridge is washed out, the spirit prevented us from going to Asia. And, it, and they aren't wrong, and neither would we be for assuming that that also can be the Lord's hand of guidance in our lives. As a sense that waiting for the supernatural when simply I, I was going to turn left and the bridge was out, I had to go right. And they came to the border of Mysia and tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus, yet again, would not allow them to. They kept wanting to go left over to Asia, and God said, nope, go right. Maybe another bridge, wa- bridge washed out. Maybe they ran out of money. Maybe there was no homes to take them in. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul gets a vision of a man in Macedonia. That's Philippi. Translate that as the city in Macedonia is Philippi. Standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia, help us. And after Paul sees the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. His plans are changing, and he gets this vision. And oh, can you imagine the side eye that Timothy was giving Paul? Because guess where there ain't no synagogues? Macedonia. (laughs) Guess where you don't need to be circumcised? Macedonia, right? I can only imagine they wake up and Paul says, Timothy, we were going to go to these synagogues over here, but we're not going that way. Oh, I can only imagine Timothy going, you're, you've got to be kidding me, Paul, right? Still tender from his wounds. No synagogue in Philippi. They wanted to go to Asia, but the Spirit prevented them. So they get there. And we're now in Acts 16. Now, this isn't just a so they get there. This is the journey. They were in Antioch. They go to Troas because they kept having to turn left instead of right. They're in Troas, and he gets this dream to go to Macedonia. That journey was 785 miles on foot is what he did. I don't know how long that took, a long time, months. And then, thinking that they were uh, potentially where they should be, Timothy thinking that we've arrived or we're going to stay for a while, they get up and immediately go another 150 miles off the map that way to Macedonia. Woof! What a journey. So they get there. They arrive. Acts 16. Luke continues the story. They're in Philippi, and on the Sabbath, he goes outside to the city gate near the river where expected to find a place of prayer. Again, not the synagogue, but the, the, there was a common tradition of going down by the waterside on Sabbath to pray. And the only people down there were women. You're going to notice this contrast that Luke demonstrates here. And also notice that in this very Roman place, it is not, I think, coincidental. Paul finds himself first sharing the gospel with women, or the tradition of women being first to see Christ resurrected from the tomb, or the tradition or the prominence of the women bringing the letter of Romans to the church that Paul entrusts. There is a theme that is not even buried, but we tend to bury within our culture of the prominence and role of women throughout the spread of the gospel within the even early church movement. I don't think it's coincidental that the essential church plant that really spread from there into all of Rome, what became Roman Catholicism, starts with a convert at the river who's a woman. And her name was Lydia. She was wealthy. We know that because she had purple garments. She was a worshiper of God because of Paul's message that he shared with her. And when she had, and the members of her household were baptized, probably there in the river, she invited us to their home, Paul, Timothy, Silas. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she says, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us to come and stay at the house. Brings them in, hospitality, baptism immediately. Let's take care of each other. Come, come to my house. And it wasn't long after that church had launched that Luke tells the story of let's go out and share the gospel in Philippi. 
We're going to get into the meat of what gets Paul in trouble. So he's spreading the gospel in Acts 16, 16 through 24. Oop, don't have that one, sorry. And I'm just going to tell you this story as Luke spells this out in Acts. When they were going to the place of prayer where we met by a female slave, now notice the contrast. Paul goes to the river and finds the women praying. They receive Jesus and are baptized. He goes into the city. There's yet another woman, but there's a contrast here. A female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Interesting. Interesting. She earned a great deal of money for her slave owner, for her masters. Probably being a little like the modern day equivalent of tarot card reading and palm reading, that kind of thing. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She's not wrong. Right? She's telling the truth. She kept this up for many days, they say. Finally, Paul became so annoyed with her that he turned around and said to the spirit in her, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, she was no longer fortune telling for them. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They're angry because their their meal train's gone. The... Once again, story of the perpetuation of abuse of a woman by the controlling authorities of a man and the simple contrast of Jesus bringing freedom to a wealthy woman by the river where the church is launched and the contrast of a woman possessed and physically enslaved by slave masters that Paul, even in his frustration and annoyance, it doesn't say he looked on her with compassion, you know, like Jesus. He was annoyed. (laughs) Might have turned to her annoyed. Get out of here, spirit. The spirit does. And I think it's because Paul did not want the church in Philippi to be launched by the testimony of a demon. Probably. He did not want the testimony. She was telling the truth. It wasn't get out of here. You're, you're blowing it. This is not what I'm here to do. It's you're telling the truth you are not the, the, the voice that is proclaiming this gospel. It is Jesus. And the owners get angry. They beat him with the magistrates. They throw him in jail, them together, and they put him in stocks. That's basically those wood shackles that lock your feet up so that you're not allowed to move. It says they were flogged as they were beaten. This would have been an illegal beating and an illegal imprisonment. And it would not have been something that Paul, um, he would have been within his rights to challenge that with the magistrate. Paul was Roman. Paul was in just Italicum Philippi and was granted all citizenship of Rome. Paul was also not breaking the law. And this process now of being imprisoned illegally, beaten illegally, and without trial illegally. Now we find this intimate connection that Paul starts to have permeating all his letters of what it's like to be in Christ and in in his sufferings. Now Paul is thinking, ah, starting to glean, what did Jesus experience? What was this like to be Jesus? Paul's sentiment through his letters and through this book and through his other letters from prison, you get the sentiment that he understands that Jesus didn't come to die on the cross so that we don't have to. He came so that we can join him there. And that's the heaviness of the gospel. Jesus dies on the cross because he empowers us to join him there, not escape it. And Paul sees that and finds himself joining with Jesus on the cross. But it gets weird in the jail. And I want to give you the best of Luke's story on this because it's fascinating. In Acts 16, 
The story continues. They're beaten, shackled, in the chains. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. Weird response after being beaten, but he's doing it. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. I would imagine walls may be coming down. At once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. It's getting wild in the jail. The jailer wakes up and when he saw the doors open, his first response is to draw his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought he blew it. And I, I know that I should, I should just die now before actually dealing with what's to come for blowing it. Paul shouted to him, don't harm yourself. Stop. We're all here. Nobody's left. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's an interesting question. It's the question that everybody asked Peter at Pentecost, right when the Holy Spirit descended on the church. The first instinct when the Spirit descends he asked the same question, what, what do I need to do? And he responds, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. The jailer took him home. He preached in the home. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took him in, washed and tended his wounds and then immediately, he and all his household went out to the river and got baptized. I, I don't think, and this is me talking, I don't think Paul went through like a systematic theology. I think he said, believe in the resurrection of Jesus, that he is the light and life, and be baptized. And I think that's what they believed. And then I think they stepped into the obedience of baptism. It's the model of Jesus of saying, come, you belong in this family. Start being in this community, and I bet your beliefs change. We talk about it branches. Belonging before believing. And belonging even before behaving. He didn't preach them behavior modification. You need to renounce this and this. There is a place for that. But the place that Paul, I imagine, had in there in the gospel is saying, I preach Christ crucified. Jesus is real. He invites us into a new kind of seeing and a new kind of community. And the way that you embark on that journey is through baptism. Start there. We sacretize something earthy and real and come out of the water symbolizing something powerful and new. Born again. You are a new creation. That's what he taught him. Christ would save him and submit to baptism. So finally, when it was daylight, the magistrates who were in charge realized something is very wrong. They also realized that Paul's a Roman citizen and get nervous. So they say, Paul, you should just kind of go away quietly. Let's not make a big deal about this. Go out into the night. <laughs> Let's not make more of this than we need to, Paul. <laughs> and Paul... Paul says, I'm good with making much of this. If you're going to come down and free us, we're staying right here in this jail, and you're coming all the way down here in broad daylight and releasing us. Because probably the practicality of what's not in the text is I don't think Paul wanted to be grabbed up in some other Macedonian city as a prison escape. To say, I left in the night as an escapee. He wants it marked. I was let out of jail. And... I was led out first by Christ who released my chains. And now you're going to come down and say the same thing that's already true. I'm not chained anymore, and I want you to come down and say it. And so they do. They come down, and he says, and it's at daylight. They ask, let's do it at night. Paul says, no, broad daylight. You're coming down in broad daylight and releasing us. And they do. And that is what is initially the launching of the church in Philippi. Becoming really the central hub of Rome, what became the first of the branches that spread out that becomes Christianity through modern day Europe. And what we now know to be what became the birth of like Roman Catholicism as it spread into ultimately becoming the state religion of Rome. But it starts here in Philippi. So when Paul is later arrested, yet another time, not this time when in chains, but arrested yet again. 
and probably starving, Philippi hears about it, and they send him a friend. The friend comes many, many, many miles, almost dies, provides for him, and Paul says, I need to give you a letter to send back. And this is the first 11 verses of that letter that I'm going to close with. This is Paul's letter to his friends in Philippi. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending the, and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long for all of you, how I long for all of you for, with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and what may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is how Paul opens his letter to his friends, with a prayer and a greeting. And over the next several weeks, we're going to walk through this very, very poetic and beautiful letter to the Philippians that is providing us a new way of seeing. It is not have Paul's vision, but we're tapping into what did Paul learn to have vision for his circumstances where he is no longer under the circumstances, as the expression says. I'm under the, under the circumstances. I'm doing okay. Paul is writing to his friends, praying for them to say, in Christ, we exist over the circumstances, on another plane, a new way of seeing, a new way of feeling, a new way of existing, a new vision for your fellow man and your friends, for the church, for the gospel, a new way of loving, a new way of launching this upside down kingdom where everything seems to be a little bit on its head. And that will be our launch into the book of Philippians. So my ask of you is to read these 11 verses and read the whole letter. It's only four chapters. That way we walk into it empowered with what God was doing through Paul and get a sense of familiarity with it. I think get a sense of asking yourselves whether Paul's prayer for Philippi is applicable as a prayer for us and whether that's a prayer that God honors and answers. But the ask will be, what truths, as we go into this book, transcend Paul's context? And what does this letter tell us about universal truths that existed in Paul's understanding of God that apply here and now to branches in our lives? Because there are plenty. There are plenty. Let's pray. Father, I, I want to pray Paul's prayer for his friends at Philippi and pray this over branches. I pray, Lord, that your love, Jesus, may abound more and more and that the knowledge and depth of insight that we at branches receive would be astounding. So that branches would be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Fill us as a community with the fruit of righteousness, Father, that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.